Two Canadians arrested and detained in Egypt have gone on a hunger strike to protest their conditions. Their friends and family back home are asking Prime Minister Stephen Harper to intervene personally. Who bears responsibility for getting travelers and journalists out of conflict zones? With more on that, here's Mark Terry. He's a documentary filmmaker himself and a visitor to conflict zones. He is also communications coordinator at York University, and thanks for coming in and helping us out with this today. My pleasure. Well, what's the latest you can tell us about uh, these two people in, in jail in Egypt? Well, they were in you know, horrible uh, situation when they were first incarcerated. They were put in a, um, a prison with 38 other uh, inmates, and they only had one toilet and one sink. Hmm. And uh, lots of negotiations um, were put in place in order to move them to better quarters. Now, I understand they're, they're in a, a better cell, but I don't think um, the numbers of people have diminished too much. John so, Grayson is yeah. the film, but you know him. Yeah, he's a, he's a professor at York University. So you know yeah. him well. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> why do you think the Egyptians are not releasing them? I don't know. I think um, it's probably because they're a little sensitive about what could be. Uh, nothing that he's done, you know, he just went in to ask for directions, basically. And um, just, he was, should set the scene a little bit more. He was out on a night after curfew? Um, yes, I believe it was after curfew, mm -hmm. and he couldn't get to any other traditional place to ask for directions, mm -hmm. so he went to the police station. And a very Canadian thing to do. Right. <laughs> yes, well, right. Yeah. But uh, not there. Yes, So he went exactly. into the police station, and what happened? Well, um, there was a threat on the police station um, earlier by the um, Muslim terrorists, and they believed that when he asked for directions to Gaza, that uh, he might be connected to this. And so that was the whole reason for grabbing him in the first place. He's just, uh, along with the other doctors, started a hunger strike. Why do you think they've done that? Uh, I'm not sure. I think he believes that uh, this is um, a good move to raise awareness of a situation. Which it has done. Which it has done, yeah. And, um, and hopefully with that additional awareness, there'll be some uh, resolution to his, uh, his problem. Why do you think this case of these two Canadians has received as much attention as it has? Well, because I think deep down um, Canadians believe that um, this particular situation, he's, he's innocent. He's really you know, an, an innocent victim in all this. And, um, and, and we believe that when we travel, we have nothing to do with the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, that's not the Canadian thing to do. Uh, even if you're a documentary filmmaker doing a documentary on the Muslim Brotherhood, you're keeping your distance. So um, I, I think we believe that, um, it, that you know, this could easily happen to one of us if we were to travel and ask for directions. So I, I think there's uh, an element of relating to his predicament and we want to rescue one of our own. You've been in some ticklish situations yourself. Mm -hmm. Where have you been? I've been to Kosovo, um, just um, uh, at the end of the war in Kosovo back in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, I was doing a documentary there uh, for um, global television called We Stand on Guard. And, um, and that was um, a horrible situation to be in because it's war. And um, you're never quite sure what's going to happen to you because at any time um, you could be grabbed and, and held and detained just like John is. Right. So. so presumably you took some precautions before going over? Yes, of course. What did you do? Well, I was working with uh, the Royal Canadian Regiment and um, I was basically um, embedded in their camp. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't wandering around on my own. You know, I always had um, other soldiers with me, um, with our camera crew the whole time, so. Flak jackets? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the full gear, the helmets and everything, yeah. Did you have a contingency plan in place in the event that you were nabbed? Um, no, not really. I didn't have any kind of plan of my own. I knew that the, the footage to me was the most uh, important thing, so I had a contingency plan for it. Not necessarily for myself. Wait a second. <laughs> you, had, you had a contingency plan for your video, mm -hmm. but not for yourself. Right. Uh, probably because I was confident that um, I would be okay. And maybe that was naive of me. Yeah. Yeah. You think? But, uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, but I, I was um, prepared to have the footage reach um, the station back home so we would get there. <laughs> How much of a difference do you think there is between being, say, detained by the authorities, such as they are, or by a private militia? Well, there is a bit of a difference because a, a private militia holds you for um, reasons that they suspect are um, um, dangerous to the cause, whereas a government will, um, will hold you because um, 
they're not quite sure of anything yet. Hmm. So they don't want to necessarily release you and have all the information that they don't have go with you. So they tend to investigate a bit more, whereas the militia usually identifies you as an enemy of the state to begin with and will um, we'll keep you there um, until you're no longer a threat. When you were in Kosovo, did you ever come close to getting in trouble? Yeah, we, we came in, in <laughs> close to trouble a couple of times. Um, there was, um, uh, we were going along Highway 9 in, um, in a tank, and um, uh, most of the road was uh, cleared of landmines, but not all of it. There were some on the, um, on the edges of the road, and there was a Hummer behind us that ran over it and, uh, and blew up. So there were some dangerous moments that were still there. Casualties among those? Yes, there were. Yeah. Yeah. How much pressure do you think news organizations place on journalists, documentary filmmakers, those kinds of folks, to take the risks to get the big story? I think there's a lot of pressure for that, especially in the, you know, these days of, of um, social media and uh, internet access to the stories. It doesn't have to go on television. It can go everywhere. So there's an awful lot of pressure to get that scoop or get the big story. And I think because of that, broadcast journalists today take the extra risks that they may not have done in the past. Mm. Now, your friend and, and the doctor as well are obviously uh, very prominent. Uh, mm being held right now in a very prominent situation. There was another woman named Amanda Lindhout, who everybody also knows nowadays, uh, who was not a trained journalist, but who, from Calgary, and just decided, you know what, I want to go where the big story is happening, and I may not be trained as a journalist, but I'm going to go, I'm going to see what I see, and do some journalism, write a book, whatever. Yeah. And uh, she got more than she bargained for, obviously. She was captured for 15 months, held hostage uh, in Somalia. Mm -hmm. Margaret Wente from the Globe and Mail wrote a piece about her, and I want to quote a little bit of that and then get your views on this. <clears throat> Here's Margaret Wente from the Globe. Ms. Lindhout's travails, she endured gang rape, starvation, and disease were undeniably dreadful. Not for a moment did she deserve any of it. And yet, my sympathy is tempered by the fact that narcissistic, recklessly naive people like Ms. Lindhout are often their own worst enemies. They bring trouble not only on themselves, but on their families, their helpers and fixers, and the governments that get involved in rescuing them. What do you think? Well, clearly there's some, some truth to that. I don't necessarily um, believe that it applies in this case, but um, anybody can do anything. <laughs> and if someone wants to do a story and call themselves a journalist, even if they're not represented, um, by any of the estates, they can go out there and, and do a story. And without proper preparation and in naivety can get themselves into trouble. That's absolutely true. Um, but I think professional journalists, um, broadcast journalists, print journalists, um, they're prepared for situations like this. And they're usually assigned a story when they go out. Uh, they're not running on their own. Right. But in, in Amanda's case, she was looking for the big story. Yeah. She clearly got more than she intended. The story mm -hmm. had a happy ending, thankfully, for her. She's alive. Right. She wrote a book. Yep. Or she she co-authored a book, I guess, with somebody else. Yep. I think there's a Hollywood movie in place. Mind yep. you, her family, I think, exhausted all of their savings in order to help get her out of her predicament. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so to Margaret Wendy's point, do you have a little less sympathy for, the, for that kind of a situation? Because what are you doing going to Somalia? What are you doing when your government tells you not to go to Somalia? What, I mean, you know, all of these things are at play, right? Yeah, you kind of have to um, question the motives a little bit, but also the preparation. Um, had she done enough legwork beforehand, allowing her the access that would prevent her from being captured, mm -hmm. um, that would have been a more professional approach, and she probably wouldn't have ended up as she did. Um, I'm only assuming she didn't do this, uh, because of what happened. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an easy thing to prevent, and, um, and I think a, a proper professional journalist would do that. Who do you think, w when a, when a, for lack of a better expression, when a rookie finds themselves in that kind of a situation, mm -hmm. whose responsibility is it to get them out of that situation? Well, um, as many people as possible, as, as, as many organizations and governments that can um, um, uh, put the effort onto you know helping them out. It's it's not necessarily their responsibility because they got themselves in, into this problem. Mm -hmm. But I, I think um, any Canadian that travels abroad that faces this possibly happening to them would like to know that the government's got their back. True, and let me just play devil's advocate yeah. here. But if you're a Canadian traveling abroad today, 
you are smart enough to know that Egypt is not a smart place to go. Mm -hmm. But your friend went there anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, everybody hopes for the best in this case, but do you yeah. think the Prime Minister should be picking up the phone and calling somebody over there and doing something? It depends on how far it escalates. When it becomes um, a, a real political hotbed issue, then yes, he will be um, uh, called upon to do that. He's already been called upon to do it. Should he do it? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's getting to the point when he should. Um, you know, having 30 days of detention is, uh, uh, without charges being laid is, is unnecessary. And um, he absolutely has to step up and, um, and intervene because it's now become a, a political issue. The Canadian government, though, does issue travel advisories. Right. And it tells people, these countries are too risky for you to go to. Mm -hmm. Don't go to them. Yep. Egypt is on that list. Mm. So to what extent should the Prime Minister and his office and all of those he has access to be on the hook for a happy outcome to this story mm -hmm. when if your friend and the other guy had been listening in the first place, yep. they wouldn't be there. No, I understand that. The original reason for going was, um, um, was to train um, uh, people in, in surgical technique and medical techniques. That's what the doctor was doing, right? Mm -hmm. And that was the original kind of um, good mission reason to go. But, um, and I think because of that, they decided to ignore the advisory to go because this was a more humanitarian mission they were going on, so it was important. They weren't going as tourists. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't even going as, a, as documentary filmmakers. Um, so I, I think in that kind of situation, the fact that they were um, arrested and detained um, makes their case special. And so, therefore? And therefore the government should do everything they can, especially at this stage. For the first week or so, mm -hmm. sure, you know, let, let them investigate and let them see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But this is getting out of hand. It's a little too late now. So I, I think the government needs to step in at this stage. Hmm. Uh, amidst all of this, let's finish up on this. The role of luck. Yeah. You've got to be lucky if you want to go to a dangerous place, right? Yep, absolutely. And I mean, you stop thinking of your own situation mm -hmm. in Kosovo. Mm -hmm. You ever think back and think, my goodness, if not for the, you know, if not for the role of plain dumb luck, yep. it was his tank instead of my tank, well, and maybe right. I wouldn't be here. Yeah. No, absolutely. Luck is a, a big part of it. But also, you can reduce the reliance on luck with preparation. And, and we were very fortunate to, um, to have a lot of training before we went. Um, same with, um, I went to another dangerous place a couple of years ago in Antarctica to do a, a climate change documentary. Different kind of danger. Different kind of danger. Yeah. It's natural danger, man versus nature, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but the same sort of preparation rule um, is in place. Hmm. So if you look at everything and research as much as you can, know where not to go, where to go, um, how to get there best, and, and all these kinds of things, you, you really mitigate the, the chance of um, falling into any kind of trouble. Well, of course, we all hope that you see John Grayson again at York yes, University before long. Yes, we all do. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. That's Mark Terry, documentary filmmaker, communications coordinator at York University. Thanks, Mark. Welcome. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.